Fabio. Oh, hey, Brandon. Wait, where you're not reading EGs and you're on service. What what's going on? Taking a break. Oops. Doing what? I'm actually reading my favorite book ever, Cosmos by Carl oh. Sagan. Well, guess what? You're mm. gonna be surprised. I invited uh Andrean. Oh. Yeah, she's she's won a lot of awards for documentaries she's made. Huh? And uh I think she knows Carl Sagan. <laughs> well. <laughs> uh, yeah, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Welcome, man. Fantastic. It's great to be with you both. Actually, oh, by reading the book, I learned that your EEG brainwaves were recorded while you were thinking about your love for, for Carl Sagan. Now it's traveling the cosmos. Is that true? It, it's partially true. There's more to <laughs> um, Yes, I did permit myself a brief personal meditation mm -hmm. on my love for Carl. We had just expressed our love for each other for the first time, mm -hmm. only days before my brainwaves, my EKG, my mm. heart sounds, and all of the signals that my body was sending out were recorded for an hour while I was mm. sensorily deprived okay. and then compressed into a minute of sound mm. that was included on the famous golden record, mm. which is now the most distant object ever touched by human hands and has a projected shelf life of one to five billion, with a B, years. Wow. And so um, this meditation was also about the history of the earth, mm -hmm. its geological and biological history, and the, the, the rise of technology, and many other thoughts, but I have had kind of a mental itinerary. Um, and it was a long shot, and it is a long shot because there are two tiny spacecraft um, making their way at 38,000 miles an hour wow. or the closest thing to eternity yeah. that we've ever touched. Mm -hmm. And also included music, mm -hmm. images of life on Earth, mm -hmm. the sounds of Earth, Mm -hmm. and uh, and this meditation which could outlive us all that's beautiful i think it's fascinating to think that someone in outer space sometime might learn how to read eegs thanks to to you <laughs> <laughs> well it's, you know at the time in 1977 mm -hmm. i just you know asked carl if he thought it was possible that my brainwaves could be deciphered the way that some of the other messages, the scientific hieroglyphics, the other messages on the record could be. Yeah. And he said, well, a billion years is a long time, so go do it. But, you know, it seems to me that in the last 45 years, yeah. we on Earth have become so much closer to being able to interpret what the brain is doing. Yeah. And, uh, and so I think it might be possible that my brain waves will be interpreted here on Earth before yeah. any extraterrestrials <laughs> put their hands on them. Speaking of uh, you know, going back in time, um, well, like forward in time, and I'm also thinking about backwards in time. So the, you know, we haven't, a uh, long time ago, people had very different ideas about how the brain kind of works, and in particular, what epilepsy really is um, than they have now. And I, I loved a story that you told um, you know, in, in the documentary. Actually, I guess you had, it was your words, I think uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson was kind of uh, saying them, but um, about uh, Hippocrates. Would you mind telling that story? Actually, it's a very personal story for me. Oh, yeah. Because, um, because it was reading a translation of Hippocrates when I was a very young woman. Mm -hmm. That that actually inspired me to fall in love with science. I was not a science student. I was much more interested in literature and history and politics. Mm -hmm. But when I read this translation of Hippocrates and what he said about epilepsy, you know, the essay is called The Sacred Disease. Mm -hmm. And he has this insight in which he says, someday, we're going to understand what causes epilepsy. Mm -hmm. And we call it the sacred disease. But once that moment when we begin to understand what really causes it, mm -hmm. it will no longer be sacred. We will no longer think of it as divine. Mm -hmm. and, and 
and just to extrapolate beyond that and to think this is the opening of a door into a new way of thinking. Find the cause, which was Hippocrates, if he was an individual or a school of brilliant, uh, really people inventing science in a very, in a very deep way. But he understood that we had to find the cause. And of course, he wrote about the fact that we should, we should be careful about what we eat. We should take care of our bodies. There are physical reasons why people become ill, why people die. And so this great demystification, when I read this as a young woman, I felt the awesome power of this way of interrogating nature. And it seemed to me one of the greatest revolutions in the history of thinking. There's another story from from that episode five, and that we wanted you to get your to, to your thoughts on, which is essentially that where uh, Angela Mosso, that Italian physiologist, that tried to record the dreams of this kid um, who actually had epilepsy and was named Giovanni Throne, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, can you can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. Well, Giovanni had been essentially abandoned by his parents as a toddler because he had a terrible fall mm -hmm. and began to have seizures constantly. And uh, I think his parents at that time, that we're talking about the 19th century, were really baffled by what was happening to him. And it was too much for them. And they dropped him off at what was essentially a, a hospital of the time, mm -hmm. a psychiatric hospital of the time. And there he languished for years mm -hmm. until Angelo Mosso, mm -hmm. uh, a scientist who was like Hippocrates, a believer mm -hmm. in demystification. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he began to observe this beautiful child and he developed with this very, you know, this incredibly meager technology from our point of view, which involved feathers and tiny, you know, pools of water in which a patient could float without, um, so that they were not connected to anything and so that the finest measurement of what was happening could be made. Well, this little boy Giovanni mm -hmm. still had a part of his brain exposed because of this horrendous fall that he'd had as an infant. Mm -hmm. And so Maso had the idea of attaching this very sensitive, primitive mm -hmm. um, um, technology to see if it could measure what was going on inside his brain. And he did this for some time until one night, in the middle of the night, he began to do this experiment mm -hmm. and he realized to his astonishment mm -hmm. that Giovanni, who was fast asleep, was mm -hmm. dreaming. He mm -hmm. was recording a dream. Mm -hmm. A dream was a phenomena of the brain that could be measured and that was real. And so, um, so sad about this child because he lived in a time where the world was not in any way prepared to accept, to love him, to nurture him. Mm -hmm. And his vocabulary was very, very limited. Mm -hmm. But at one point he said, I want to go to school. Mm -hmm. And of course, because people were so fearful of anyone who was different in any way, mm -hmm. he was deprived of this human right. Wow. And um, and died, but we remember him because right. of Maso's genius. Yeah. Um, so that's the beginning of brain imaging, really, isn't it? It's, uh... It is. And I, I have to say, I should credit Dario Robleto, a mm -hmm. brilliant artist, mm -hmm. for introducing me to Maso. Mm -hmm. uh, and he has written extensively about Maso and Maso's whole life. Maso mm -hmm. wrote a book about fatigue because of his political concerns about ah, yes. the way that the people of Italy, especially the working poor, who'd been kind of really just vacuumed up into the Industrial Revolution, were being worked to death. Mm. And he wanted to demonstrate 
that this was a kind of crime against humanity, that mm-hmm. people had a limit. Mm-hmm. Um, and not just people, he was, you know, he wrote about how exhausted birds were when they flew from North Africa to Italy. He was a, <laughs> just a brilliant, totally curious uh, mind. Well, I, want, I want to show you a, a little trick if, if it's okay. Um, so Fabio and I have been practicing yeah. and uh, mind reading and I'm going to try to transmit some thoughts over to his, his mind and see if he gets them. To focus. But did you get that? Yeah, I think I did. I think you're, you want to ask Annabelle Hansberger how EG was created? Yep. Oh, we're getting good at this. <laughs> wow, I'm, I've never been a believer in perception, but you just I'll witnessed explain it. This, right? It works. Well, Hansberger is another yeah. fascinating person because uh, as a young man, he was going to be a soldier mm-hmm. and he was, um, he had a, a near death experience where he was riding on his horse and he fell off the horse in the path of a very uh, heavy military transport, mm-hmm. horse driven, of course, at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he came within a hair of, being, of having his skull crushed by the transport. Mm-hmm. Okay, so he was still shaken that evening Mm -hmm. when a messenger arrived with a telegram Mm -hmm. from the person closest to him Mm -hmm. in his whole life. He was a young man, he was only in his early 20s, his sister. And she was concerned that something had happened to him. Apparently, at the moment that he had this experience, Mm Well, it, this changed the, the trajectory of Hans Berger's life. Mm-hmm. And so he went from uh, what he, he was going to be a soldier, and now he was going to be a scientist, a physician and a scientist. But he feared that if anyone found out what he was trying to discover, which was the existence of exactly the extrasensory perception that you guys just demonstrated, <laughs> um, that he would be the laughing stock. Mm-hmm. So he had a position teaching at the university. He, you know, mm-hmm. was a scientist mm-hmm. and he had a hidden house mm-hmm. out in the country. Mm-hmm. No one knew about where he would go and create the, and do these experiments with uh, essentially an inverted bowl on his head with electrodes and to try to see if he could actually measure thought and discover how it was possible for his sister mm-hmm. to know at that moment that he was in danger of losing his life. Mm-hmm. Well, in the process, he invented the EEG, a very name of this podcast yeah and uh and uh in secret Mm -hmm. and but it was clearly he he figured out how to measure the brain's Mm -hmm. activity but uh his he never shared this information Uh, Mm -hmm. people knew about it but he was very secretive until the end of his life Mm -hmm. when um when he tragically took his own life uh and so, but we owe him a great debt. We sure do. Absolutely. Yeah. La- last thing I wanted, we wanted to ask you about was um, we, in, in the uh, episode of Cosmos that you made about you know, where you tell some of these stories, um, we really loved the end when uh, Dr. Tyson's, I think his brain waves kind of explode out of his head and they <laughs> connect with the, the whole universe. What, what uh, can you My tell brother. us a little bit more about what was, what the idea was there. It was was such a beautiful image and uh, cool ending. Well, we were thinking about the concept of a connectome. Mm -hmm. The idea that it would be possible, you know, don't freeze people, don't cut their heads off and put them in the freezer. No, (laughs) the idea is what what if we could create a connectome, which would be in a way analogous to, uh, to let's say a human genome in that it would be the sum total of all the thoughts, memories, experiences 
knowledge contained in a single human brain. And of course, you know, that is a, a dream that remains somewhat distant. But if you could do that, the idea of making contact, not just with, you know, as with Voyager, of which I'm very proud, but not just a bunch of recordings of music and this, but instead the consciousness, the complete consciousness of a human being. And so my fantasy was there could be such a thing as a cosmic connectome, a way of, of reaching out so that the consciousness, if, mm-hmm. if, there is, if there are other conscious beings in the galaxy, mm-hmm. could somehow make contact. And so that was the inspiration for that. Yeah. Such a beautiful idea. It's Brilliant. Beautiful. And it, yeah, I really like how you made the analogy also from the cosmos and the connectomes in the cosmos with the uh, with the brain being its own cosmos and having all the neurons kind of yeah. firing up and connecting with each other. So I thought I really liked that. That was really awesome. So glad. It makes me really feel good. That's we should wrap up. I, we want any other final tips that you have for our EEG lovers out there on Earth and in outer space? Well, I do have one thought. And yeah. that is... Mm-hmm. You know, I think that if we could really read each other's minds, if we could really know what other people are thinking, I think it would make us so much more compassionate towards each other because we would recognize ourselves. And we would also know that so many of the mechanisms, the coping mechanisms, the defense mechanisms that people have are simply a cover for our fear. Mm. And um, so I wish you many discoveries in and many uh, developments in what you're doing, because I think that the application is potentially far more uh, widespread than simply people who uh, manifest um, anomalies with their brains. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so no much problem. for joining us on the, yeah, this has really been a pleasure. Yeah, It's been awesome my meeting. pleasure. Great questions. <laughs> yeah. So nice to meet both of you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.